Yeah, and I mean, with the algae problems and, like, your diatoms and stuff, the more chemicals you add to your tank, the more problems you're going to have down the road, especially yeah. if you don't... Because a lot of people that I know that have done, like, chemicals for algae, you're supposed to do water changes and keep up with a bunch of water changes to make that process happen. Uh, but they just keep, you know, dumping the chemical in and then they're wondering why stuff's starting to die. What's up, Reef Fanatics? Welcome to another episode of the Coral Reef Talk podcast. Levi and I have an exciting episode for you guys today. We're talking about fish that have a purpose in your aquarium. Worker fish. Yes. So oftentimes when you jump right into the hobby, um, you get excited by like the more ornamental fish, like very beautiful colors, clownfish, throw a bunch of fish in your tank. But oftentimes we experience a different pest in the anim in the anemone. We <laughs> oftentimes we experience pests in our aquarium. We experience algae. And on top of having a cleanup crew, it's very important to get fish that have a specific job in your aquarium. Definitely so agree with that. How important is it to have fish that, that do a job? I mean, I think it's quite important. I mean, if you try to do a tank without any worker fish for say i mean you might have to run into more some more manual work yourself uh, but you're always going to want to like look out for some algae eaters especially and then like certain fish that target certain pests if you're having issues with the pest you may have to look into that uh there's invertebrates that take care of things as well but today we're talking about fish so you just kind of want to keep I know what you're going to get, like I said earlier in the past episodes. Yeah, and different size aquariums plays a part in this too because there's some worker fish that you want to add to like your cleanup team or your crew in your aquarium, but they're not going to do well in like a smaller aquarium versus a, a larger aquarium. Yeah, exactly. Um, like you can't put a tang in a five gallon, you know? Um, yeah. It just wouldn't work out. Yeah, definitely for sure. You don't want to squeeze a larger fish in a tiny little tank for sure. Because tanks, they need that room to swim around and to move. Definitely. So, so before we jump right into it, how was your uh, Thanksgiving? It's December now and Thanksgiving is behind us. I mean, how was it? It was good. Good to hang out with some family and eat some food and just enjoy the day. Yeah, it was, it was a ton of fun. I'm kind of sad that it's over. It's one of my favorite holidays. I mean, yep. it was almost Christmas time. It's crazy. It's December 1st and yeah, counting Sometime. down. Yeah, getting close. So talking about fish, but you've selected a couple fish that are important to the utility fish that you can have in your aquarium, important to adding to your cleanup crew, just worker fish in general. Uh, what do you got for us today, Levi? Uh, so starting off here, um, I have a picture of an Atlantic blue tang. That's what I personally have in my reef aquarium and the Caribbean tank. But th this, I'm kind of referring to all tangs, really. You know, uh, just having a cool fish that is able mm -hmm. to keep up with your algae growth. And they eat a wide variety of algae. They'll eat just about any species, uh, sometimes hair algae as well, uh, but not typically. But they will munch on algae because, I mean, that's what they do all day in the wild. Is they just constantly graze and just munch on algae. Um, obviously you're not going to be able to put these in your nano tanks. Like we said earlier, you can't put them in like a five gallon or even a 10 gallon. A lot of like the zebra soma tanks, which don't get as big. A lot of people usually say 75 gallons is kind of the limit for those. Yeah. And that is of course for long-term success. Like you could probably put one in a 40 gallon, like if it's super small and grow it out and then maybe upgrade it, but it's not going to really live in there long term and be completely healthy because these tanks, they love to swim. That's what they do in the wild. They're never in the same area for very long. They constantly just graze on other reefs. So Yeah, for sure. And that that's a very pretty tang right there. It's a pretty blue color that they have. So, I mean, it goes to show you that just because you're finding a fish that has a certain job or is they don't have to be like an ugly fish. There's some really nice. beautiful fish that will chow down on algae all day long. And uh, speaking of the zebra zoma, variety we have the yellow tang here it's a great fish to have in your reef aquarium of course the larger tank like levi's saying this one's a little bit harder to find usually going to pick them up captive bred now biota doing a good job over there with the yellow tangs well this is one of my favorite tangs just the pop of yellow that you get in your aquarium with having a yellow tang and then having him graze on algae all day long is just really the yellow cool. tangs are some of my favorite as well. Yeah, they're yeah. super. The zebra so genus in general is pretty sweet. Yes, uh, sail fins, purples, gem tangs, black tangs. Yeah, so if if you can keep a tang in your aquarium, I say go for it. They're definitely a really cool fish to have. But another fish that I think 
I don't know if this fish gets overlooked often, but fox face. What about a rabbit fish in your aquarium? Yeah, rabbit fish are some of my favorite as well. I mean, they're good herbivores. They'll graze on algae similar to tangs. A lot mm -hmm. of the times in the wild when you see them, they're grazing right alongside other tangs. Yeah, they're really good to have in your tank. I mean, I've heard of people saying, oh, they're, they've nipped at zoas and they've nipped at a couple other corals. But, I mean, who's to say tangs won't do the same thing? I mean, as long as you keep a good supply of algae in the system, I don't think you're really going to have any issues. I mean, if you run out of algae completely and you're not feeding algae like on a little algae clip or anything, you might run into that when they start getting a little hungry. But, I mean, as long as you're keeping their algae supply and their natural food source available, then they're going to eat that. Yeah, and, and this is another fish that you kind of want to keep in like a 75-gallon or larger. Yep. Uh, this guy can grow pretty large. I think, well, like eight, eight inches or so. Yeah, eight to um, nine inches, I would say, for that species. And um, one thing to look out for, they do have a venomous spine yes. up there. So you got to be careful handling them once they're in the tank. You're fine. Just don't be... I guess reaching your hand around the fish all the time, but yeah, they they're great. I had one in the 210 gallon tank for a little bit before we kind of changed what type of fish we wanted to have in there, and then we caught him, took him out. We had a Picasso trigger fish as well. Nice, uh, but we ended up getting both of those out and getting different fish. But yeah, this guy's great. A fox face, just the way it interacts in your reef aquarium, great algae eater for sure. Definitely. All right. So we got tangs. We got fox face moving right along through the algae eaters. If uh, you're having trouble manually controlling algae, how about a lawnmower blenny? Mm -hmm. So lawnmower blenny, they are fascinating to watch. Um, they bring quite the character to your aquarium and you can keep these guys in like around a 30 gallon tank or larger. You probably get away with a little bit smaller, but I think generally around 30 gallons is what is recommended for this guy. Yeah, they can get it. Those that specific species can get kind of large. Yeah. Oh yeah. 30 gallons would be plenty. I mean, even for some of your smaller nano systems, I mean, you can look into like the bicolor blenny and tail spot blennies and some of the other smaller species that don't get as big. Yeah, and all of these that we're talking about right now are going to be great for algae control in your reef aquarium. And I kind of wanted to throw this one in there because he works well in a smaller tank. Um, yep. So so we're not just talking about larger aquarium fish. We're, we're going to have a mixture as the podcast goes on. But yeah, this guy is great. Uh, we had one years ago, and my wife is always wanting to get another one. So we'll probably probably be adding one to our system here shortly if not find some kind of blenny to add to like the small 10 gallon tanks like the smaller blennies you were talking about yeah i've always yeah. liked the uh the starry blennies too they're a little more expensive but they're like kind of like a blackish color with like white dots on them those are pretty cool yeah those are really really neat we'll have to throw up a picture of the starry blenny now it's time for levi's scientific segment of today what do you got all right so today we're going to be talking about the orange sun coral this is probably one of my favorite lps corals uh, i wanted to throw a coral up we've done a fish the past couple days uh with this species tubastria cosinea uh tubastria kind of stands for like a tubular like structure so hence like the tubular like structure of this coral uh super unique um, it's probably one of the more common species of coral uh, in the NPS world, that is. Uh, and it's common in the hobby. You just don't see too many people keeping it long-term because it is quite challenging if you're not going to feed it. Uh, but as long as you're feeding this coral some mysa shrimp, brine shrimp, or some other meaty-like foods, this coral will thrive. This is actually my specimen in my deep water tank. It's doing quite well. Uh, I can't wait to see what the future has for it. Oh, yeah, there's your scientific segment. Just a little bit about a coral that I enjoy. So That's really cool. How often are you feeding this guy? Uh, once a day right now. Okay. So I've actually, I don't really have the light on in this tank much. So I turn the light on and usually I kind of blast the tank with a little bit of oyster feast uh, from Reef Nutrition. That gives like, a, the, I don't know, it's weird. The polyps kind of sense it. Mm -hmm. Polyps open right up real wide. And then I tend to get some mysis feast or some beta brine in there. Very cool. TDO pellets as well, so it loves the TDO. Yeah, what, back when when we had a seventy five gallon, I tried my hand at some sun corals and stuff in there. They're they're pretty awesome. Yeah, they're cool. And, um, I believe they're found in like underwater caves. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they yeah. could be like upside down in the, in the caves and stuff, like on the rock works and 
Yeah, you're going to get them in caves and kind of just shaded areas. Uh, yeah. There's places down in the Keys you can literally go to a dock, and there's some on the dock on the underside of the dock as long as it's shaded. And even some of the bridges in the Keys, like the Seven Mile and a few other bridges have some of this on it. So, I mean, if you have if you find a heavily shaded area uh, mm -hmm. in Indonesia, the Indo-Pacific, or even the Atlantic now, they've kind of hitchhiked their way over here, you'll find them. So, I've even seen these at the Skyway Bridge. So. Okay, very cool. So, something that Levi and I are very excited about is each week here in December, we're going to be doing a giveaway of different aquarium products from different companies. And you don't have to sign up for anything you don't have to enter anything you just got to be a part of the coral reef talk family and leave a comment down below here on uh, the youtube video side of things but today we're going to give away a printed reef product and we're giving away the mushroom cage now the mushroom cage is used to hold a mushroom coral in there and keep it safe from like blowing around your your tank while it has a chance to kind of settle on the frag plug but there's a larger version as well so if you need a larger mushroom cage you can win that or if you just need the regular size the two inch size you can win one or the other just leave a comment down below saying that i want the mushroom cage and you will be randomly selected for the giveaway for this week's episode sweet all right so now we're gonna be talking about certain fish that eat certain pests or that attack certain pests Starting off, we have the copper band butterfly fish. Now, this isn't going to be for, like, you know, the newbie reefer. I wouldn't recommend it. Not saying it can't be done, uh, but mm -hmm. they can tend to be a little finicky. So you definitely probably want to end up quarantining these before you add them to your system because uh, they can get some internal parasites. Uh, but if you get a good, healthy specimen, quarantine it, uh, keep it healthy. Uh, they're pretty hardy once you get them established in your tank. Uh, they will eat some of your smaller anemones like your aptasias. And your Mahanos. I've actually used them in the past to eat the Mahano anemones. I got those pretty bad a year or so back. And they wiped it. My specimen wiped it out rather quickly. But after that, they do tend to... I had some feather dusters in the system. They do eat feather dusters, so keep that in mind. Okay. I've even heard of some people using them to eat feather dusters. Because some people get the, you know, those little white ones and they kind of just don't like them. I'm not entirely sure why. Uh, but they eat those as well. And if you're not careful, they can potentially pick at other anemones like even your larger bubble tips so just keep that in mind i mean if you have a clownfish or two hosting in that anemone you're not going to have any issues because those clownfish will protect that anemone but they are a really cool fish to see you know have in your system they got some cool colors and there's also some other species of butterflies you could do as well but copper band it's a well-known species it's mm -hmm. being captive bred now uh so that shows that it is possible, you know, to keep these long term and even breed them in captivity now. So that's pretty sweet. Yeah, and I mean, uh, they're going to eat your mysis shrimp and your brine shrimp too that you're feeding. So, I mean, as long as you keep them fat and healthy, you really shouldn't run into any issues, especially yeah. after they're, you know, done dealing with your aptasias or mahanos. Keep them well fed and you like, even with any fish, you really shouldn't have much of any issues. And now another one that kind of keeps pests at bay like going after like flatworms and like smaller little pests in in between the rock work would be the six line wrasse here this is uh, one of my favorites that i've had in every single reef aquarium that i've set up however a lot of people don't like them because they they can get aggressive but i mean i've never really experienced too much aggression out of my six line ras because i've had other tank mates in the aquarium too so i have the other larger fish in there like the yellow tang kind of keeps them at bay so he's not like the main fish picking at everything you know so they just cruise around the tank uh doing their job picking out the rock work all day long it's a great pest control in my opinion yeah but six lines are one of my favorites too and they're good for the smaller systems because they really don't get that yeah, big so that's one true. of those wrasses i mean most wrasses you can't keep in nano tanks but six lines you can kind of get away with in certain circumstances yeah for sure i would say this is another 30 gallon tank or larger fish but yeah and then the colors of this fish as well like look orange. at the color there you got the greens the blues the orange it's just overall pretty fish that has a specific job and he knows his job too so it's going to cruise around all day picking off the pest and the rock work and places that you can't reach so yeah. good part of the uh cleanup team for sure definitely but an honorable mention or another fish that we could talk about would be the matted filefish or the aptasia eating filefish. 
Um, I have one of those in the 125, and I think he does an amazing job at getting rid of Aptasia. Yeah. And like you said with the butterfly fish, very similar. Um, if you keep them fed, keep them happy, he's not really going to mess with anything else. Like I have a ton of zoanthid corals in there, and oftentimes you hear about filefish going after zoas as well as Aptasia, but I haven't really had any issues uh, with this one that I have in in the 125 right now that's good yeah i mean another honorable mention for me would be like the uh springer eye damsels those are okay. known to eat flatworms and they're rather peaceful and they're really pretty they're like a sapphire blue they're really cool and even some that have the same job and just different colors if you're looking for something unique or something different for most people to kind yeah. of you know stand out from the crowd there's so many options and that's why i love this hobby yeah absolutely and like an, another reason to have a fish as part of your cleanup crew or team so that you're not throwing things at your tank to solve a problem mm -hmm. so you're not just adding like a product to your aquarium to get rid of aptasia especially with aptasia like you can use the products like like aptasia rx you can clear out quite a bit of aptasia with it and it doesn't cause any issues with your aquarium but it's the ones that you can't see it's yep, the ones exactly. behind the rock work that you're not going to be able to reach um, that these kind of fish can can get at, like the butterfly fish or the aptasia eating file fish. Yeah, I mean, with the algae problems and like your diatoms and stuff, the more chemicals you add to your tank, the more problems you're going to have down the road, especially yeah. you don't, because a lot of people that I know that have done like chemicals for algae, you're supposed to do water changes and keep up with a bunch of water changes to make that process mm -hmm. happen. Uh, but they just keep, you know, dumping the chemical in and then they're wondering why stuff's starting to die. I mean, all those chemicals and stuff can mess with your pH and all your parameters. Yeah. So you just got to be really careful because, I mean, even if it says reef safe, I mean, the more you keep adding that stuff, the more something's going to build up in your system and potentially cause it to crash. So just be aware. Yeah, absolutely. And and not just that, but not keeping up with your aquarium on a routine schedule or mm -hmm. getting a little relaxed with some of the maintenance that you do on your reef aquarium. I mean, we all do it. I don't think there's any reef aquarium hobbyist or anyone with a saltwater tank that keeps that schedule to a T. You know, there's always yeah, yeah. a day where you're like, oh, I don't feel like messing with the tank or, you know. So, yeah, if you're using products and you're not following the ins instructions and then you aren't doing the water changes. Yeah. To your point, that stuff's definitely going to build up. Yeah, sure. So, But yeah, so today we just wanted to present some options for you as far as uh, utility fish that are going to be great additions to your cleanup crew because we talked a few weeks of weeks ago about getting some snails and hermit crabs in your tank too to kind of start that cleanup crew that team uh, but adding these fish to your aquarium is really going to set you up for success later on down the road because these guys are going to constantly eat those algaes constantly go after those flatworms the aptasias just keep that tank clean for you in places that you can't reach or that you're not even dealing with yeah for sure so all right levi any closing remarks or any um additional tips when getting a fish picking a fish or anything with the utility fish that we can have in our aquarium i mean like i always say just do your research know what you're gonna get and kind of plan it out ahead of time you know on if you are battling issues like we were talking about in this episode but yeah there's so many different avenues and so many different options i mean it's, that's one thing i really enjoy about this hobby i mean there's more than one way to fix a problem and i mean if you can do it with the fish and not a chemical more power to you because i try to stay away from the chemical treatments as much as i can because i mean i don't really you know enjoy messing with that because it causes a lot yeah. of like maintenance upkeep and you got to stay on top of it otherwise you can cause more issues so yeah. fish route just definitely go the fish route yeah, because we're creating a an ecosystem that works together, right? So why not pick a fish that's going to do a job for you? Yep. And then once you get those fish that are part of the cleanup crew, then you can start adding the more beautiful fish that aren't really going to pick out algae or mess with anything. They're just, they just look really cool in your tank. So. Exactly. But thank you so much for checking out this episode today. And if you have any questions about any of the stuff we talked about, leave a comment down below. And if you want to check out a video where I talk about Aptasia eating file fish, you can go ahead and click or tap the screen to watch that. But thank you so much for hanging out here on the podcast, liking and subscribing, and we will catch you in the next one. See ya.